Hi, I'm going to talk today about how to take an arbitrary flow sensitive effect system and automatically add support for tagged delimited continuations. So what does that mean and why do we care? Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about a class of effect systems that take advantage of program ordering information. So unlike something like Java's checked exceptions, which really doesn't care if you throw this exception or that exception first or do other stuff in between, there's a broader class of effect systems that can help us solve problems like keeping track of lock ownership in the presence of unstructured locking, so explicit lock acquisition and release, uh, tracking atomicity information, heap shape dependent locking information, uh, or a whole slew of related systems which keep track of various forms of program histories uh, to make sure programs basically are doing things in certain orders. Uh, and there are many more such systems that take advantage of ordering which I'm gonna call sequential following some terminology Ross Tate set out uh, in 2013. We're gonna model them today as these things called effect quantiles, which is an algebraic structure that is an abstraction of these sequential effect systems. So in addition to having a least upper bound of two effects, there's also a way to compose them in a particular order. And the other nice thing about that is that the details of the prior work included working out a derived iteration operator. So for most effect quantiles, there's a way to automatically add support for dealing with things like while loops by basically giving a form of fixed point operator on those effects. As an example, let's look at an effect quantile for event traces, which as I said, there are many systems in this space. Uh, so we're gonna look at a distillation of many of the common ideas. The basic idea is we have a, a set of interesting events, sigma, which maybe are for security, maybe they're related to some per other particular protocol that you care about. Um, and given that set of interesting events, the effects themselves are going to be sets of sequences of those events or sets of traces or formal languages over those interesting events. To make this into a real effect system, we need to define two operators. Uh, we need to define sequencing, which here is just pairwise concatenation. So if you run something with effect X and then something with effect Y, the result is going to be the set of traces composed of some trace from X followed by some trace from Y. Least upper bound is just gonna be set union. And there ends up being a nice unit for sequential composition, which is the singleton set containing the empty trace. And if you take this, and you run it through the prior work, uh, you also get out a derived iteration construct. I do want to mention though, that we are not limited to just things like regular expressions. This is not restricted to something like regular languages. It, it can go well beyond that. So we can take that nice generic framework uh, and we can do a whole bunch of things without caring about the exact effect system, as long as it satisfies the axioms for an effect quantile. So here's the sequencing rule. We can prove that this is sound for any effect quantile. Uh, if you have two L-typed expressions uh, and you run them in a particular order, then the effect is the effect of the first followed by the effect of the second, composed with that ordered composition of effects. And we can do that for meta theory. We can build generic implementation frameworks. And then for either the theory or for an implementation, we can plug in a choice of effect quantile like these traces we just saw. And we can get out something that gives us more meaningful traces or more meaningful uh, judgments on actual programs that might say things like, oh, well, for this first expression, it might perform a check or it might do nothing. The second expression is going to perform some access of interest to us. And so running them in sequence, we're either going to perform the check and then an access, or we're just going to access. And if your security policy says, well, all accesses need to be preceded by checks, now that's enough to know that this program is problematic. So that's great. And we can make this work for the Lambda calculus. We can get polymorphism working. We can, as I mentioned, uh, get while loops working, recursion. Uh, but when we take this and we want to adapt it to modern mainstream languages, we get stuck. And the problem is that there's really no prior work on combining these sequential effect systems with anything beyond loops and recursion. There's one uh, sort of exception, which is that answer type modification for delimited continuations is itself an example of a sequential effect system, but there hasn't been any work on how to actually combine other sequential effect systems with delimited continuations. 
So right now, if you want to take some nice effect system from the literature and make it work correctly for Java or C Sharp or Python or JavaScript or any of these other languages with these exceptions or generators and so on, basically you can't. So what this work is really about is how to make that work. So how to take one of these effect systems that may not know about exceptions or generators or so on and automatically add support for these things. So today's talk basically is tackling the problem that sequential effect systems currently lack a standard account for non-trivial control flow. Again, modulo that exception I mentioned a moment ago. And we're going to give a transformation that takes an arbitrary sequential effect system without knowing its details, just some effect quantile, and adds support for tagged delimited continuations. Once we've done that, not only can we deal with tagged delimited continuations, but because we can macro express all sorts of other control constructs in terms of tag delimited continuations, we can also derive type rules for those specific constructs. And in addition to that, uh, there's 27 years of prior work that fits into this effect quantile box. And now we can use all of that with these more advanced control constructs. So how does it work? Well, first let's talk about delimited continuations. Delimited continuations are the most general kind of single-threaded control flow. You can use them to express exceptions, generators, fibers, many, many more things. Um, and the basic idea here is building on the idea of uh, traditional continuations. You make the context surrounding an expression a first-class thing that the program can manipulate. So the program can capture the context, it can duplicate it, it can discard the current context and replace it with another one. And in addition to all these things, it can do this up to certain bounds, uh, which makes it easier to build certain kinds of abstractions. So this is very powerful. Um, we're going to talk about a subset of rackets delimited continuations. So there's a number of different versions of delimited continuations kicking around uh, with a number of different trade-offs. These other variants can be expressed in terms of rackets uh, delimited continuations. We'll see on the very last slide that there really is a reason I needed to pick rackets delimited continuations. For the talk today, we only have time to scratch the surface of this. So we're only going to talk about two pieces of these continuations. The first is this prompt construct. Basically what this does is it labels part of the context with this tag. Um, and when it evaluates, basically it evaluates the body. And if the body evaluates to three, it returns three. Um, but the body might also use a control operator. Uh, and the simplest control operator we can talk about is this abort construct, which also takes a tag, which says basically where it's aborting to. So basically what this does is it evaluates the expression uh, and then throws that result to the handler for the nearest dynamically enclosing prompt with a matching tag. So pictorially, it looks kind of like this. So basically, if you're running some computation in the middle of some prompt body and the next thing to evaluate is an abort, Basically, the abort will discard the abort itself, all the surrounding context up to the nearest prompt with the same tag, and just pass that value to the handler for that prompt. So a couple of small examples. If you try to add three to the result of abort T5, the addition doesn't happen. Instead, that five gets thrown to that here identity handler, basically because the semantics match that abort T to the nearest enclosing prompt for t, looks up that handler, and passes that 5 to that handler. This includes cases where there might be unevaluated side effects. So if we try to abort t5 and then print something, the print never happens. We basically get the same result for the same reasons. And if this looks like it's sort of hinting at something like exceptions, like try catch, well, that's good because Basically, it's straightforward to macro express a basic form of try-catch in terms of these constructs. So we can already start to scratch the surface of some of these derived rules. So how does this get hard? How do we combine this with sequential effects? Well, let's take a, a slight tweak on that print example from the previous slide uh, and look at this. So we're going to, in the body of the prompt, uh, abort then check permission. And in the handler, the handler is going to perform some access. So there's two things about this that are tricky. First, the abort is going to skip the check permission. So that permission check is just not going to happen. If we fail to notice that it doesn't happen, that's bad. 
because we don't want to pretend something's going to happen that's important that we care about when it won't actually occur. The other thing that's important is that because there's an abort in the body, this will cause the access to occur, right? That handler will not, will not run unless there is actually an abort executed. So if we miss that, that's also bad. So in general, if we're going to integrate sequential effects with uh, this kind of construct, the effect tracking needs to basically be aware of the possibility of skipping some segments of program code when it comes to effects tracking. So here's an example of how we start building up to that. In the paper, I build up the full construction for tag delimited continuations in a number of stages. We're only gonna cover the first stage today. So the first stage is we're going to take uh, some underlying effect quantile, whose elements are represented here by Q, and we're going to wrap it up uh, with a bunch of uh, supporting extra information. So we're gonna build effects with two pieces. The first piece is an optional underlying effect. So for example, a set of traces that correspond to the abort-free executions of some expression. So if no control operators are used, that's the effect basically. So this is sort of the special case of we're not actually using the delimited continuations. Uh, the other piece that we need, of course, is how do we deal with executions that do use these control operators? Well, we add a control set. Uh, so here, for what we'll see today, the control set is just going to be a set of these abort TQ constructs, which basically say uh, we aborted to T after first doing things characterized by effect Q. So basically this is the effect up to an abort or up to a throw. Now to make these into a real effect system, we need to define least upper bound and sequencing. Least upper bound is easy, it's pointwise. Uh, sequencing, we need to basically consider what are the possible uh, kinds of paths that execute through this. So one possibility is neither expression whose effects we're sequencing actually doesn't abort. Uh, in that case, they both have these sort of quote unquote normal effects, Q and Q prime, and the abort free uh, behavior in that case should just be Q followed by Q prime as long as they're both there. Now, we still need to deal with the control sets though. So in general, there's basically two ways uh, one of the expressions we're characterizing with these effects might abort. Uh, either the first one aborts, in which case the second one doesn't execute at all, or the second one aborts, but that only happens if you've already executed the first one without aborting. So that's why when we look at the control set in the result of sequencing these effects together, we have the unmodified control set from the first effect, because if that one aborts, then the second one doesn't run at all. And then we union that with the result of prefixing the second effects aborts with the abort free non-control operator using executions of the first expression. The basic idea here is that we're only adding stuff to the control set from the left. So Q prime doesn't affect the control set at all. So if we take this and we look at our example from a minute ago, if we look at the body effect, we have the effect of the abort followed by the effect of the check and if we simplify that down, we get that basically we abort after doing nothing because we abort immediately. And there are no control free executions of that code because it immediately aborts. Uh, so this handles one of those tricky aspects of that example because we've now we've dropped the check, right? We are recognizing that the check is not going to occur. Then how do we deal with that handler? Well, the handler is going to be checked at the prompt. So at the prompt, basically, the prompt looks at the effect of the body, which includes abort-free behaviors and aborting behaviors, and says, well, the effect of all possible paths through this prompt are basically the least upper bound of the abort-free executions, which here there are none, with taking the effect up to an abort, so the I here, followed by the effect of the handler, because if there is an abort, then the handler will run after the execution prefix up to the abort. So here, this simplifies down to the body of that, sorry, the effect of that whole uh, prompt expression is that it performs an access. 
So we're good. We've now actually taken care of the fact that the check is dropped and we've taken care of the fact that the access is triggered by that control operator. That's unfortunately all we have time for today. The paper has quite a bit more. It has the full development, uh, including the extension to tagged delimited call CC. The key idea behind that further extension is basically the idea that sometimes we need to predict the latent effect of whatever computation or context we capture without necessarily knowing it ahead of time. And then we need to validate that uh, elsewhere in, in a different judgment. It also contains derived rules for exceptions, as well as the use of this derived iteration operator from previous work uh, to derive rules for double checking our loop construction and also deriving new rules for generators directly. Uh, also in the paper, there are lots of additional complexities from multiple tags interacting with each other. Uh, in tag delimited continuations, often the tags are sort of left as, well, the semantics will do the right uh, obvious thing. But here, actually, the presence of multiple tags really does complicate things. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, now we can use sequential effects with try-catch, with loops, with generators, and anything else you can express via tagged delimited continuations, which is almost, almost everything you need for Java and C-sharp. Turns out the one thing we haven't handled yet is finally blocks, or synchronized blocks are, are related, which you can encode via dynamic wind and this is why we chose the racket operators, because the racket uh, folks have worked out the full formal semantics for how dynamic wind interacts with the constructs we were just talking about. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions.